I'm going to call the City Riding Special Committee of the Whole meeting for Monday, June 26, 2017 to order. Clerk Patrick, please call the roll. Present are Mayor Keith Hedrick, Deputy Mayor Lawrence Garish, Councilors Jill Rusk, Jamal Beckford, Stephen Sheffield, Conrad Heath, Rashad Carter, Finance Director Ron Newhouse, Clerk Deborah Patrick. Thank you. We're going to start with item 639, Freedom of Information Presentation. I've asked Tom Hennick of the Public, the Public Education for Freedom of Information uh, Commission to come to give us a presentation on uh, Freedom of Information and Freedom of Information Act. I think this will be beneficial for all of us and everybody in the room. So with that, Tom, will you, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, we always enjoy doing these sessions when people ask us to come because that means that they're interested in finding out more about freedom of information. So I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I hope that by the time we're done tonight, you feel better about freedom of information. The goal tonight is not to beat you up, to make you miserable. It's to answer questions, to try to give you the tools you need to work with when it comes to freedom of information. I encourage questions. Anybody, you know, as we're going forward, uh, don't wait, don't save them up to the end. I may say something, you may say, hey, wait a minute, we don't do it that way. I'm not here with handcuffs. It's not, it's not that sort of a thing. It's, the idea is to try to, to build your comfort zone around freedom of information. I do these sessions all over the state, uh, and I of, often try to tell people just a little bit about me before I start. I'm not an attorney, and I don't know if that qualifies as good news or bad news. I don't know how you, <laughs> how you feel about that. But the reason I share that with you is that I'm not here to give you any binding legal opinions. It's not an order. It's not a command. It's based on, you know, 16-plus years at the FOI Commission, and what I've seen, what I've seen the commission do, what I believe they would tell you under certain circumstances. In the interest of full disclosure, before I joined FOI in 2001, it seems yesterday, but it's a long time ago, I was a journalist. Now, I don't know if that's good news or bad news. I don't know how that plays. I don't know what your relationship is with, with the journalists that, that pay attention to you. But it gives me a different perspective. You know, I, I've seen FOI from both sides. I, I, uh, most of my day at the commission is spent answering questions on the phone. Yeah, Deb can attest to that, answering emails, trying to you know, keep people uh, informed as to what they're supposed to do. And a lot of times when I'm answering those questions, I can, I can hear myself asking them on the other end, way back in, in my other life. And the third thing I'll share with you, and, and again, many of you out here who are uh, board members, is that a lot of times when I go out and do these sessions, people say, hey, Tom, you, you just don't understand. We signed up to help our town, to help our city, we didn't sign up for this FOI stuff. We're volunteers. We do this, you know, we have our real lives during the day, and then, and then we come and we do these jobs, and people yell at us and call us stupid and all that stuff. Well, I get that, too. For 10 years, I was a member of the board in the town where I live, the chairman for the last five, so not, I know what it's like to go home, gulp down dinner, and then run out and go to a meeting. It's, sometimes it's like, it's like a second full-time job, and sometimes you're underappreciated, and I, and I get it. But the part about... You know, not worrying about FOI, I can't, I can't let you go on that one because it's the law in the state of Connecticut. It's been the law for 42 years, and it was, uh, it was put in place in the wake of Watergate at the, at the, uh, with the impetus from Ella Grasso when she ran for governor for the first time. That's how far back it takes us. She was very committed to open government and transparency. A lot of people think sort of spurred on, uh, inspired by what she saw not to do when she was in Congress and the whole Watergate thing was, was roiling around her, and she pushed this law through, and, and she pushed it through, and those of you who are politically uh, inclined or savvy will get a kick out of this. When, when she put it forward, she said, this law is so important to our state, I will see to it that it is approved unanimously by our legislature. Now, I want you to ponder that for a second. Think about just what's going on up the road right now as they're trying to put together a budget. Think about guaranteeing a unanimous vote on this law or on anything. Well, she got it. I, I'm here to tell you that there was not a single no vote in the House, not a single no vote in the Senate. That shows you the mood of the, of the state back then. It was an important law. But on the other hand, to get there, you're creating a law that's based on a simple concept. But if you're familiar, again, with how things happen, there had to be a lot of compromise. So when you read this law, although it's based on that simple everything's open, everything's transparent kind of idea, there's a lot of you're sort of scratching your heads. Have any of you ever tried to work with it or tried to see it or say, hey, wait a minute, what are, what are, we, what are we supposed to do here? Because sometimes your eyes roll the back of your head, the wherefores and the whereas and things like that. 
And so we're, we'll try to break it down a little bit and make it simple, but the reality is because it's written that way and everything is not clear cut, everything's not in a nice neat little box, a lot of times those of you who are on the front lines have to be able to, to make decisions, to be able to interpret this law Sometimes on the fly, you're sitting here at a meeting, and gee, do we go into executive session? Don't we go? And sometimes you have to make a call based on your based on your best information. And when you make that call, somebody might not agree with you. And one of the one of the things that the gray areas uh, generate are people who say, "No, I don't think the public agency was right on that one," and so they file a complaint with the FOI commission. One of the things this law did was create the FOI commission. So when people believe they've been denied the access that they have a right to, they file complaints with us. And our commission's role is to adjudicate, to say, okay, you were right, you were wrong, this is what you should do. And that's the final word, unless somebody wants to appeal a commission decision. And commission decisions can get appealed all the way to the state Supreme Court, which shows you the, the fluidity of it. It's not always, it's just not always black and white. There's a lot of gray area here. One of the, one of the first things that I always tell people to remember is, you make the decision based on your best information and based on you know, what your instincts about open government, your, about making sure you do things the right way. And if somebody files a complaint, it doesn't automatically mean that you're wrong. Again, you make your decision, they file a complaint, and if you're prepared to defend it and you think you've done the right thing, nine times out of ten, you'll probably be okay. Another thing, sort of a, a preliminary thing that I always tell people is that it's called freedom of information, but it's not really about free information. It's about access to two basic things. It's about access to public meetings and access to public records. A lot of people see freedom of information, though, and they think it's an invitation to ask a lot of questions. How did you get there? What did you do here? How did that happen? You know, I know those of you who are in offices in town hall or city hall, you see that. People come in, they say, you know, under FOI, tell me how did they get to that number? How did they? Well, that's not what the law is about. We're, we're all public servants, right? So we're going to answer questions for the most part. But you may reach a point where you're not comfortable doing that, where you're saying, you know, that you, you really have to do a little of the work yourself. You have to go to the meeting where we're going to talk about that, or read the records, or, and sort of gather the information yourself, because if I'm answering the question, I might be interpreting your, your question incorrectly or something like that. And if that's ever happened to you, I know it's happened to Deb, you know, people come in and say, under FOI, you need to tell me, da-da-da-da-da. I want you to think for a second about working at the Freedom of Information Commission and having people call and ask you questions. They think we're the information center for the entire state of Connecticut. They call up with all sorts of questions and all kinds. People tell me that I should maybe put together an hour of stand-up to sort of share with people about some of these things that come in, you know, your phone call, uh, uh, can you give me directions to the Capitol? Well, yeah, I mean, I can, it's right across the street, but that's not, you know, that's not what we're here to do. Um, here, here's an email just to give you an example. This came in just a couple weeks ago. Under the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act, I'm requesting an opportunity to obtain copies of public records for all licensed cemeteries and crematories. So they're, they're, they think that we're sitting in a, in a big vault with every record held by every agency and we just push a button and out it comes. And so you have to explain to them, no, that's, that's not what we're there to do, that's, that's not what the law is about. By the way, that came on behalf of something called Plotbox. I thought that was kind of interesting. Have you ever heard of Plotbox? I have no idea what that is, but it's Plotbox. So, so again, the first thing is, is to remind folks that it's about access, access to your meetings, access to your records, and that you're not necessarily the, you know, the answer man, you're not necessarily there to you know, interpret things, research things for them. So, so because this is, is for a board, I'm gonna spend most of the time on meetings, but you may have questions about things relating to records, jump in and ask them as we go forward. When we talk about meetings, here's a basic definition. Meeting means any hearing or other proceeding of a public agency, any convening or assembly of a quorum of a multi-member public agency, and any communication by or to a quorum of a multi-member public agency, whether in person or by means of electronic equipment, to discuss or act upon a matter over which the public agency has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. The bottom line, folks, is that anytime you gather in any fashion, those of you who are on boards, anytime you get together to do your work as a board, it's defined as a meeting in the law. And it means you've got to do some basic things. You've got to make sure the meeting's properly noticed, that it's open to the public, and that when you're done, you create minutes that reflect what happened at that meeting. A lot of folks get into trouble with, with words. Well, it was just a workshop. It happens a lot in budget season. It's just a workshop. We don't need to worry about that FOI stuff. You want to call it a workshop, it's fine. But if that's your task, 
that's a job that you're assigned to do, you got to make sure it's, you, you recognize it as a meeting. Well, let's form a subcommittee. Subcommittee's not the whole board, then we don't need to worry about FOI. Again, wrong answer. There's a, there's a phrase in the definition of public agency, which is really long, I won't, I won't read you that definition, but it says, including any committee of or created by. So you're a public body, if you create a subcommittee, that subcommittee technically is a new public agency that has to follow the same rules. Make sure you're noticed, make sure it's open, and make sure they're minutes when you're done. People say, well, wait a minute, we'll, we'll get together, we won't call it a subcommittee, but we won't have a quorum. And that way we can get around all this FOI stuff. Now, there's one that is a, as a former chairman of a board, I wish I could tell you that I could answer that with authority. There's actually a, a, a superior, an appellate court, I'm sorry, an appellate court ruling that says if you do not have a quorum, you have no meeting under FOI. There's also an appellate court ruling that says if you do not have a quorum, you're still having a meeting under FOI. So you've got the appellate court of Connecticut telling you basically the opposite thing, the two different rulings. So when people say to us, well, what are we supposed to do? I said, to be safe, even absent a quorum, you could be having a meeting. Now, I use the word could because it depends on what you do, it depends on what you talk about. Um, there are many municipalities that have rules that say no quorum, you, you can't meet. But there are others that don't have that, so people say, well, we don't have a quorum, we'll still do some stuff. So if you do that, <coughs> consider it a meeting and make sure you follow the same rules. Uh, by the way, you, know, you think, well, Shouldn't somebody make a, make a call on that? That matter actually went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court heard oral arguments and then said, nah, well, we have improvidently taken this matter up. You guys take care of it and leave it. And so they, left, they let both matters stand and left us kind of holding the bag. So a word of caution, even absent a quorum, it could be a meeting. And, and that's, you know, there's a, now right now, you know, stay tuned on that one. We, we made a ruling that a non-quorumed gathering was a meeting and it ruled against the city of Meriden and they've taken it to court. So maybe we'll finally get an answer one way or another. But right now, that's what the law says. The law talks to us about three different kinds of meetings. It talks to us about a regular meeting, a special meeting, and an emergency meeting. A regular meeting is a meeting that you have per a schedule that you submit to Deb. By the end of January, we meet on the first and third Tuesday, the second and fourth Monday, whatever that is, that becomes your regular meeting. Special meeting is a meeting that you have when you're not scheduled to meet. A lot of people see that word special and they get all like, ooh, ooh, what do we, you know. Special meeting can be about anything. The only thing that's actually special about it is that it's not at your regular time. The key is that at a regular meeting, should something happen that's not on your agenda, you can vote to add it to the agenda. So, you know, you see something, you say, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add you know, a topic of uh, conversation traffic on, on Route 1 or something like that and it's not on the agenda and you make a motion and if two-thirds of you want to do it, you can add it to the agenda. But at a special meeting, you can't add anything. So when you're preparing an agenda for a special meeting, you really have to be very specific. So, so an item like other business or old business is pointless because, you, unless there's something specific underneath that because you can't add anything. Um, you know, on a regular meeting, it works because, you know, is there any old business? The mayor says, and you say, yes, I'd like to talk about this issue we talked about a couple weeks ago, and you can vote to add it. But if it's not mentioned specifically on an agenda for a special meeting, you can't add it. I, I use the word agenda. Remember, your agendas have to be available at least 24 hours in advance. Be careful of things like Monday meetings and meetings that follow holidays because it, count, it doesn't count the weekend. It doesn't count that holiday. You know, a lot of times I'll get calls on a, on a Tuesday morning after a, after a Martin Luther King Day or after a President's Day, and people are all, you know, oh my gosh, our meeting is tonight, it's our regular meeting, and I always put the agenda in on Monday, I forgot we were closed, so, you know, it's an emergency. Well, it's not an emergency. That third kind of a meeting, the emergency meeting, is a meeting that I always recommend that you try to avoid. Emergency meeting is an unnoticed meeting. And the law doesn't really envision a lot of unnoticed meetings. It wants you to do and all the boards to do their work in public. So if you have a situation where, where you, you, know, you forget to put in an agenda, oops, I forgot, it's not considered an emergency. The law sets the bar really high. You know, I, I don't want to get dramatic, but think about you know, you know, life-altering events. Think of, of you know, heavy winter storms or flooding or things like that where people are in serious danger, where there's a problem, somebody could get hurt. Uh, that's when you have emergency meetings. Otherwise, you really try to avoid them. 
and make sure you get that notice in. That notice that needs to be available at least 24 hours in advance. If you think you have an emergency, and you know you may, at some point you may, uh, you know, don't fall back on it thinking that anything could be an emergency because it, you know, the consequences could be, could be serious. Uh, somebody says that was no emergency, they should have noticed that meeting. We've had situations, one of, the, one of the commission's strongest powers is it can declare null and void something that happens at an improper meeting. And, uh, you know, the short version of a, of a case we had in Ridgefield a couple years ago, Ridgefield had a, had a situation where they called an emergency meeting and a, and a person challenged it and we found that it wasn't an emergency and we said, look, the reason you did this was so that nobody would know about it. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you get the idea. And, and the commission said, we, de we would declare null and void what happened at that meeting. And there was a situation where they, where they fired somebody, they terminated somebody, and he challenged it. And, and with, the, with the FOI complaint, we said, no, the meeting's null and void, which meant that he was fired at a meeting basically that didn't happen. But the town didn't like that decision and appealed it all the way to the state Supreme Court the state Supreme Court agreed with the FOI Commission. Doesn't always happen, we don't always win, but it agreed with the FOI Commission. The bottom line is that it took about seven years to adjudicate, so they, had, they spent seven years with legal fees and back and forth, and, and they still had to figure out how much back pay to owe the guy because they had fired him and then he was technically still not fired. You get the idea. So if you're thinking, gee, it's, it's a real emergency, just make sure it really is. O otherwise, wait that 24 hours, that's when the agenda has to be in. Try to get it in at least 24 hours in advance, and then, then you're covered. Now, if you ever have a real emergency, the law says you meet, and you talk about only the emergency situation. You know, I was on, I was on a school board. That's the board that I was on, and, and a couple winters back, bad memories. I try to black them out, but uh, you know, remember we had all that snow, and a lot of these buildings, the, the roof just kept started sagging and stuff like that. We needed to hire somebody pronto, professionals, to get up there and get the snow off the roof, or else we were going to have a problem. So we. That was an emergency because we didn't realize how bad it was getting. We met, but we only talked about who to hire, how much money to allocate, get that snow off the roof to, to keep the building intact in and keep the kids safe. You talk about that one topic, and then within 72 hours, you create minutes that reflect what the emergency was, who was there, and what you did about it. If you have an emergency situation, I don't know what your relationship is with the you know, with various media, I know you must have a nice, I know you do have a nice website, I've seen it. You know, put it out there somehow, it's not required, but if you put out there that the, that the council's gonna have an emergency meeting to deal with topic X, it's clear you're not trying to hide anything. Because one of the first things that happens when you have that emergency meeting that's not noticed, people say, what are they hiding? Why aren't they telling us? So if you're gonna do it, make sure you go out and, and try to get the word out as best you can and stay on topic. There's a tendency sometimes when you're in that mode, well, as long as we're all here, Let's talk about some other stuff. Don't do it. Stick to the topic because that'll keep you out of trouble. All your meetings are open to the public. Anybody can come. Uh, you don't want a sign-up sheet on the, on the door. Uh-oh, you're from the town of Groton. You can't come. You, you got along very well with your neighbors anyway, so I can do it. Okay. But you can't come. You're not welcome here. You're not welcome here. You can, anybody can, can come in and, and watch. Uh, the law gives anybody the right to audio or videotape meeting. Has that ever been an issue here? People with cameras that are obtrusive and so, um, there's some boys are camera shy and they say we don't want them here. Well anybody can audio or videotape. Now the one thing is, you know I told you this law is 42 years old. This was written when you know the big heavy TV cameras and stuff like that. If you think about it today folks, we could all be videographers with the little phones and stuff like that. And my advice lately has been look, you should always assume that somebody's recording it. A common question is, do they have to tell us? Now, I wish the answer to that were yes. I think out of common courtesy, people should say, hey, look, I'm going to record this. But, but, but there's nothing in the law that requires that. So I would always assume that you know, while you're conducting business, someone might be uh, recording. The FOI Act does not give anybody the right to speak at a public meeting. And a lot of people think that it does. It's only the right to come and observe. But if you don't want to hear from anybody, it may be political suicide, but you don't have to. There's nothing in this law that guarantees public speaking, public participation. So you can set parameters. You can say, look, we've got a full house tonight, three minutes for everybody. Or you can say, we've got too much to do tonight, we're not going to hear from anybody. Or we can say, only on topic X, or only on top, you know, you can, you can run the meeting to the point where you can get your business conducted. Um, I know that sometimes people get emotional and they want to 
know, go on and on and on, but you have a right to control that. And again, if you don't want any public speaking, you know, whatever may come your way after that, you know, you, you have to think about that, but you're not, it's just not required. So we're talking about making sure you do all your work in public. And as you probably know, because you've been around for a while, there are methods that boards can use to exclude the public. One of those is executive session. When I say that, you, you all know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. An executive session, remember, is a portion of a publicly noticed open meeting. It's not a separate entity. So even if the only item that you have is an executive session item, you need to notice the meeting. And the notice says, executive session planned, possible, discussion of one of the five reasons for an executive session. So you convene the meeting in public. Somebody makes a motion to go into executive session. If you vote, if two thirds of you say yes, then you can go into executive session. The five reasons for an executive session, broadly, a personnel matter, pending claims or pending litigation, a security matter, a property transaction. Uh, you are going to build a new firehouse and you're looking all over town for property and you're negotiating and you're reviewing um, environmental studies, traffic studies, things like that and you're going back and forth with the landowner. You could do that business behind closed doors because doing it in public might negatively impact the town's position. So you could have that conversation behind closed doors. The fifth one is something of a catch-all. It allows a board or commission to have a conversation about a document or documents that it believes are exempt from disclosure. Now, there's a lot of different documents. I'll give you a couple of examples just to think about it. Um, do you ever deal with bids or RFPs mm -hmm. as a board? There's an exemption in the FOI Act that says you're allowed to withhold bids and RFPs from, from public release until you've actually signed a contract or concluded negotiations. So let's suppose you bid a project. You put bids out for a project, and you want to review them as a board and you want to look at the different bid alternates, and you want to look at the different proposals from the different companies, you could go into executive session to do that because those documents are exempt from disclosure. Uh, you ask your attorney for a written legal opinion. It's covered by the attorney-client privilege. It's not something you're going to share with the rest of the world, so you could go into executive session to talk about the advice that your attorney has written to you. There's just a couple of examples when it comes to documents. Let me circle back to the personnel executive session. You want to be very careful with that on a couple of levels. First of all, just saying on your agenda executive session personnel has been ruled by the FOI Commission and by the courts especially not to be enough information. Executive session personnel doesn't cut it. The courts have also said that you don't have to necessarily name the individual. I had a conversation with a woman over in Newtown tonight, uh, this afternoon about a meeting tonight, and she was, she was wanting to be really careful as to how she did it. So. Executive session, possible, discussion of the performance of a town hall employee. You know, the performance of a police officer, the performance of, you know, something like that. Now, sometimes you can't help yourself. If you're a board of education, there's only one superintendent, so you might as well put the name out there. But if you're, if you're uncomfortable putting the name on the agenda or in the motion, there's enough latitude there so that if it's, it's clear, kind of, at least the extent to who you're, you know, what you're talking about, you can do that, but don't just go executive session personnel matter because the courts have struck that down. When you have an executive session for a personnel matter, you have to let the person know in advance. The person has to be given advance notice. The person then has the right to come forward and say, now wait a minute, I don't want an executive session. I want that discussed in public. I want everybody to hear it. And if the person insists on that, you cannot go into executive session. You have to do it in public. Where people get confused is they think, okay, we're going to go into executive session. We've got to invite the person into the executive session. And that's just not the case. You are allowed to. You're welcome to, especially to take testimony from that person, to hear his or her side of the story, to gather evidence, to gather expertise. But there's never a requirement that you invite anybody in. The law only requires members of the board to be in the executive session. They have that right, no one else. Now, a lot of times what happens is a person will say, well, you know, I don't want an executive session. I want that discussed in public. And you kind of know what you're going to talk about, and you know that's not going to be a good idea. And you say, what if we invite you in so we can hear your side of the story? That's perfectly okay, 
because you can invite in whomever you want. Remembering that once you get through discussing the matter with that person, you don't want to leave them sitting in the front row, they should then leave while you deliberate. When you begin deliberations, you should be the only ones in the room. And remember, when you're in an executive session, you only want to deliberate. You never take action. You don't show hands, consensus, anything like that. Nothing that even sniffs of a, of a vote. You want to make sure that your action comes after the executive session. Now, you can stay in there as long as you like, you know, kicking and screaming and fighting. With, but when you're done, you come out to vote. And the minutes need to reflect when you came out of that executive session and any action that you took. The executive session for pending claims and pending litigation is pretty much what it sounds like. There's a lawsuit that's been filed. There's a claim. There's an FOI complaint. You want to talk about your strategy, how you're going to deal with that. It's a little broader in that it allows you to talk about taking legal action. Say you're going to sue somebody. Say somebody's violated a city rules or a city law and you want to, you want to take action. You can, you can discuss that strategy behind closed doors. And the other one, the, the security executive session, you know, I used to rack my brain thinking, trying to think of an example because it never, ever used to come up. And then sadly, about five years ago, after Sandy Hook, it started coming up a lot, primarily with school boards. Boards of Education wanted to go into executive session to talk about enhanced security, extra resource officers, extra alarm systems, locks, things like that. And intuitively, when you think about it, okay, we don't want the people we're trying to keep out to know what action we're going to take, so that would be legitimate behind closed doors. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts about executive session before I move on? Because sometimes you do. Neb, you want to talk about? Well, I actually, I think Tom touched on the, the one thing that I, was, um, that I had taken notes on, um, that you should name the department and uh, right. not necessarily the person, right. but. Specifically, as specifically as, you're, as possible and or as you're comfortable with, yes. So you're okay with the way we have it now for tonight? Yes. Okay. Okay. The other path that boards can, can take to exclude the public is kind of a funky one. I read you the definition of a meeting. The sentence that follows that in the law says meeting does not include. Then they rattle off a bunch of different things, many of which everybody in this room would call a meeting. But for the purposes of freedom of information, the legislature said you can call it whatever you want, but it ain't a meeting. At least you're wanting to bang your head against the window. I mean, you just, just what, what, you know, wait a minute. Well, what it said is, okay, yes, you might think of it as a meeting, but for the purposes of freedom of information, we're removing it from the law so that you can do all of these things without notice, without being open, and without creating minutes. At the top of the list is an executive level search committee. You're, you're looking for a new police chief. So you form an executive level search committee, which, by the way, can be composed of anybody. It can be, you know, the whole council can do it. When you do that, when you formally do that, that group can look through those resumes and can interview candidates and do all those things without noticing meetings. It operates outside of freedom of information. Now, pardon my ignorance, do you have to deal with unions? Okay, collective bargaining. <coughs> Do you have to do the collective bargaining on your own? Is that as much fun as you've ever had in your life, right? <laughs> you sit in a room for hours. It's probably one of the most important things that you do, especially fiscally. You know, again, Board of Education, teacher contracts, administrator contracts, custodial contracts. We sat there for hours, back and forth, back and forth. That was probably one of the longest meetings that we had every, every cycle. But for the purposes of freedom of information, it's not a meeting. You, you, all your collective bargaining happens outside of FOI, which means you don't notice it, it's not open to the public, and you don't create minutes. Again, it's, it's somewhody counterintuitive because as a board member, it's, it's, it feel, you know, I'm going to a meeting tonight, well, not really, you know, it gets, you spin your wheels, but the bottom line is it's outside of FOI. Chance gatherings, social gatherings. A lot of times people say, oh my gosh, I'm on the commission, council now, I'm on the commission now, I'm friends with all these people, now I can't go out to dinner with them because you just told me that it's a meeting. Well, I love the way this is worded because, you know, you can, you can have a chance meeting or a social meeting neither planned nor intended for the purpose of discussing matters relating to official business. What else are you going to be talking about when you go out to dinner? Let's not, let's not be naive. My advice there, folks, is to be practical. 
yes, work is going to come up. Try to stick to the weather and the, you know, the state budget and the Yankees and the Red Sox and all that stuff. But when you wander into that area, stop short of setting major policy decisions. Stop deliberating. Don't have the, the passionate arguments that you should be having here. First of all, you never know who's sitting in the next booth, right? And that person you know, slaps you with a complaint because it's an unknown as me. But second of all, again, the idea is to do your work in public. You want to try to avoid any appearance of doing your work when you're not supposed to. That one's hard because, you know, you meet somebody in a grocery store, you meet somebody at a ball game, but just, you know, have restraint. And to that end, when we talk about meetings, when you, you might have heard it when I read the definition, whether in person or by means of electronic equipment. Now, electronic equipment was put into that law 42 years ago, you know, to tell the powerful mayor not to get on the phone and say, you're voting this way, you're doing this, I need you to do this, boom, 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 called it sort of a, a seriatim, I think is the legal term, meeting, where the meeting took place on the phone before the meeting. You can't do that. And in 2017, we're talking about a lot more than telephones. We're talking about the phone and the text and the email and the Twitter and all that stuff. I'm not telling you to not use those vehicles to disseminate information. Hey guys, I'm putting this on the agenda. What, what else do you want on the agenda? Um, I feel very strongly about this issue. Any one of you, I feel strongly about this issue. Here it is, here's my position. The problem comes when you do that and you respond and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard and I'm gonna oppose that. And then you start that argument via any one of those, you know, the blogs, the social media, the Twitter. You have to resist the urge to talk to each other via those vehicles when you should be having the conversations here at the table. We just got through with a case. Some woman, now, she was being really difficult, I'll be candid with you, put some poor planning and zoning commissioner through the ringer because she saw him pick up his phone at a meeting and accused him of texting either another member or somebody in the audience and having basically a meeting within a meeting and she wanted to see all the text and she didn't believe him when she said he said that's all there were and he was just talking to his wife about picking up milk or ice cream or something, you, you get the idea. You want to be really careful the extent to which you use those things because when you do that in the conduct of the public's business, they become public records and people can ask to see them. So you've got two things going. First of all, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't, I'm not as artful in my language when I use, you know, and I'm somewhat of a dinosaur, so I text badly and my emails aren't, you know what I mean? And so, first of all, it may be not written in the way you want it written. And the second thing is, if you're having communications with each other, it, it could be construed as an improper meeting, and then the proof is right there. So the extent to which you use those vehicles, you want to be cautious, because you don't want to be in a position where people say, hey, look, they're doing all this work, and they're not at a notice meeting, okay? You definitely don't want to do reply to all. Well, you, you know, again, reply to all could be, um, can we put this on the agenda? Mm -hmm. And you could, yeah, because agenda conversations are not considered meetings. But if it's, this is what I think we ought to do next time, what do you all think? Mm -hmm. Then you've got a problem. Then you don't want to do it. So again, avoid that. Reply to all when it looks like everybody's going to jump in and have a conversation. And it's so easy to do. You just want to be very careful the extent to which you, you do that. Well, I have a question. <clears throat> in this day of technology, yep. with social media, Facebook, Twitter, everything else, and with email, uh, there are citizens that want to engage us, engage me specifically, about city issues. And last Monday, I made a public statement that I would not conduct city business on social media, and I would not conduct city, city business via email and that if they wanted to bring up issues, they could come to citizens' petitions, or they could send us an email as a question, and we could discuss it in comments or communications and reports. And the blog just blew up that I was trying to, you know, curtail free no, speech and those kind of things. So in fact, I need they, some advice from you. In fact, my, my advice would be to do exactly what you're doing. I would avoid <clears throat> commenting on blogs. I would avoid commenting on, on some of those social media sites. Uh, answering a, a specific email to a, to a, a citizen, uh, someone you represent, 
would probably be okay if you're just going back and forth with that one citizen to the point that you're comfortable. But again, I wouldn't include everybody because somebody else jumps in and then it, then you could run the risk of being accused of having an improper meeting. But, but you know, responding to a Facebook post or things like that, we've got another case that's been going on for almost two years. Um, see if I can summarize this properly. Somebody, there was, a, there was a negotiation going on and somebody on the Board of Education leaked some of the information to somebody who put it on a, on a Facebook and people are filing complaints to find out who was the leaker and all that stuff and it's been on and on and on. Then we said they wanted to see the emails. We ordered the release of the emails. The emails were gone. It was a mess. So the, the, I would not conduct business on those vehicles. I, you could look at an email as a letter. You know, if somebody wrote you a letter, you might respond to it. Or somebody sends you an email and says, thank you for this question. I'll bring it up with the council at the next meeting. It's, it's, you really, you're, you're wise to, to curtail that. Well, and that's my stance on the email. Because what people are going to see now is I can answer emails. My thing is if we get an email, an email question, I would want it brought up here so that it is public to everybody that's watching television that's certainly or to call. the audience. That's certainly there. your call. Okay. Um, and and not, nothing wrong with that by any stretch of the imagination. Unless it's, you know, Mr. Mayor, the, the water's coming into my basement. Can you help me? You know, that yep. kind of thing. Right. I mean, that's, that's a different story. But, you know, again, you want to be careful the extent to which you share it with everybody. Maybe you get that email and send it to everybody and say, we're going to talk about this at the next meeting. You meet twice a month? Uh, well, or yeah, thereabouts? Three times a month. Okay. Two, two times a month where there is an official mayor and council meeting and then once a month where we have this type okay. of meeting. So, so again, you meet often enough and if it's something really urgent, you can call a special meeting. Sure. So if, that, if that's your comfort zone, you know, you st that way you stay away from the, from the he said, she said sort of thing and I, and I think that's a wise way to go. Okay. I really do. Um, you know, that's not, again, it's not the rules, it's not, the, it's just it, to, to be safe, that's it's probably a better way to go. Espe yeah. Especially more so with the Facebooks and the Twitter and stuff like that. It just, it just um, you're asking for trouble, yeah. okay? Uh, the last thing about meetings is minutes. Um, I assume that's your that's task. Folks, remember that minutes need not be the recreation of war and peace. They are not every word that everybody says. A lot of times people will stand up and they're blah, 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 and I want this in the minutes. Well, no. The only thing that's actually required in minutes, folks, is a record of who votes for what or for whom. That's the only legal requirement for minutes. Now, obviously, you're going to put more than that in there. You're creating a historical record for your city. You want more. But how much more is your call? It need not be a transcript. It need not be a verbatim back to what everybody says. You sort of decide you f what your comfort zone is so that you've given a nice, crisp recapitulation of what happened and that if I pick them up five years from now, I'll have an idea of what you were thinking. But it need not be every word that everybody says. And sometimes people get, you know, they want that. And you've got to be very careful with that. Your minutes need to be available in seven days. A lot of times people say, well, wait a minute. We don't meet again in seven days. We can't approve them. Doesn't matter. The minutes need to be out there in seven days. If you are going to make changes to those minutes, make them at the next meeting. And those meeting minutes reflect any amendments you make to the minutes you turn in after seven days. You don't want to be shuffling copies all around. So the minutes are in after seven days. And if you want to see how they, you know, finally turn out, you wait till the next meeting to see what those minutes look like. Okay. Are there any questions about things relating to meetings that I haven't touched on anybody? Anyone in the audience? Okay. okay. So the other piece about, you know, freedom of information is access to records. And, and when you think about records, the thing to think about is, to put it simply, basically every time you create something in the conduct of the public's business, it's defined as a public record. Two quick definitions, read together. Public records or files means any recorded data or information relating to the conduct of the public's business, prepared, owned, used, received, or retained by a public agency or to which a public agency is entitled to receive a copy by law or contract, whether such data or information be handwritten, typed, tape recorded, printed, 
photostatic, photographed or recorded by any other method. That's part one. Part two, except as otherwise provided by any federal law or state statute, all records maintained or kept on file by any public agency, whether or not such records are required by any law or by any rule or regulation, shall be public records. And every person shall have the right to inspect such records promptly during regular office or business hours, copy such records in accordance with section, it gives you the section number, or receive a copy of such records. Everything is a public record. So if somebody wants to see something or somebody wants a copy of something, they have a, a right to it. Now, what makes records compliance hard, having said that, I quickly add, there are things in the FOI world that we call the three E's. There are exceptions, there are exclusions, and there are exemptions to what I just said. So why, why tell me, you say, that everything's a public <laughs> record, and then tell me that you've got all these exceptions and things? You're just confusing me. Well, yes and no, because the best way to avoid trouble when it comes to public records is to understand that everything is a public record and then apply one of the exemptions. Don't go with that gut reaction, oh, that couldn't possibly be something I'm going to give out. That could, I, I'm not going to give that out. That's, that's personal. Well, you might be surprised. So assume that it's a public record and then look at, look at the, the, the different exemptions and see if any apply. I, I share often an example of what not to do when somebody asks for public records. <coughs> this example comes to us from the city of Hartford, bless their little hearts, <laughs> a few years ago. The person making the request is someone who makes a lot of requests. Do we, do we have those in Groton? Do we have people who make a lot of requests? <laughs> right? Okay, but you have to understand that everybody has the same rights. Now this particular person, we'll call him a quasi-journalist. He's kind of a, He's, he's around a lot, and they, at this juncture, and this is a few years back, but at this juncture, they kind of headed up to here with him. But nonetheless, he makes this request, and he asks for any billing records submitted to the city by a particular law firm doing work for the city. And then, he also asks for any record of payments from the city to the law firm. Pretty basic stuff. So the corporation counsel, I want that to sink in, the attorney for the city of Hartford writes back and says, I have your FOI request, and will coordinate the response. Such documentation as is allowed or required by law will be provided. Now folks, when you get a request for records, those of you who don't know it, you're supposed to respond within four business days. And four business days, respond means basically acknowledge. It doesn't necessarily mean produce the records, but you gotta let them know where you stand in four days. Otherwise, if you don't, it's, it's viewed a denial and they can file a complaint with us. So you always, at the very least, wanna do that. All right, so what's the problem? Well, the problem here is, that the corporation council, the guy who's supposed to help the city with this stuff, accidentally sent to this requester, who by the way is a journalist, an email that he had written to somebody else about how much he didn't like the journalist. Mm -hmm. Forgetting <laughs> that everything is a public record. You see? Now this is one that might not have seen the light of day had he not hit the wrong button, <laughs> but you know, I could do that just as easily as he could have. So now in the hands of the journalist is the following, and I'll, we're being recorded, so I will have to clean it up, but you'll get the idea. <laughs> Carl, so who lit a fire under this? <clears throat> it's a nasty word that starts with an A. Take it from there. If he's involved in litigation, ongoing and or other projects that he hasn't asked about, can I shut him down? So his response isn't really, I'm looking into your records request, it's you're a, mm, how do I get rid of you? And now the journalist has this in his hands and boom, it's up on his blog, it's up on the public access TV, and he's connected. It's on the six o'clock news FSB, it's in the current the next morning, Hartford looks really awful. Really, really stupid. So the corporation counsel, you know, says, maybe I ought to do something about this, and you can't really see it, but trust me, this is city of Hartford letterhead. He tries to write a letter of apology, but he can't do it. He doesn't like this guy. In his letter of apology, again, public record, this is gonna hit the streets. Apparently you have little else to do other than to pester me in this office and other city departments. Recall that I do not work for you. The purpose of the FOIA statute is not to provide you a playground. Folks, even if you think that, please don't write it. Because now you've created a public record that says I don't like you, I don't like your law, and this one makes the rounds. 
You know, you have to think, I'm creating public records every time I work in the context of my job here. The part that, that gall, uh, this part's sort of the humorous part, but the part that galls me and, the, and the, the finishing point to this story is, because it was him and because he felt that way about him, he never bothered to look at what he was looking for. None of those E's applied. And the next headline is Hartford loses case at FOI commission because the guy filed a complaint, none of them were exempt, and out the records were ordered. When you get a request for records, always think in terms of, okay, are these records we're going to, do they fall under any exemptions? And always try to make sure that you put blinders on. You know, when I asked if there were frequent requests, I heard, I heard chuckles and I saw heads nodding, and we all have them. I mean, we all have them. We have a guy who, between 2011 and 2015, filed almost 450 formal complaints against various agencies around the state. A nightmare. Now we've reached a point where we've tamped him down a little bit, but by the way, he's still active and he's not far from here. And he makes a lot of trouble and he comes into town halls and he churns things up. But when he came to our office and asked for records, we resisted the urge to you know, toss him out. And if they were records that he had a right to, my point is everybody has the same right. So you look at the records, and you see whether or not any of the exemptions fit, and then you follow through. And you just, you just have to make sure that you understand that you know, even the people that make you crazy, or are crazy, depending on how you want to look at it, you know, have, have those rights. Um, people say, well, OK, they're making these, these massive requests. They're asking for hundreds and thousands of records. We don't, we don't have the time, we don't have the personnel, we don't have the manpower, okay? The FOI says it's very important to understand that it's not immediate access. It's not you drop everything you're doing to provide access to records. The law talks about prompt access. And it's, it's kind of a definition that's kind of wide open because you can interpret what's prompt. Now, someone comes to an office where there's one person working part-time, you know, four days a week, it's going to take longer to get those records from a place where there's three full-time staffers. So you look at the request, you look at the size of the request, how long it's going to take to review it, and all those things. And you put all that in and say, okay, it's going to take a week. It's going to take a month. It's going to take a year. Regardless of what it is, if you're willing to go before the FOI commission, if they file a complaint and say, look, we said it would take a year, and here's why. You know, they've asked for every email from since 2005, and we have to review them, and the lawyer has to look, you know, whatever that is. And then and you take a look at that sort of thing. Um, the problem with talking about records in FOI when we don't have hours and hours is that we can't touch on, you know, some of the, all of the exemptions and the exception. Well, what about this and what about that? So before I hit a couple of them, are there any records that you might want to ask about? Anything, you know, gee, is this something we'd have to give out? Is that something? Have you had any situations recently that, that you wanted to touch on? Any specific records? Um, yeah, uh, sure, yeah. One of the things that, that I think we struggle with at times is understanding what the person's asking for if they're not clear. And I think I think we get, and I'm, I'm sure there's lots of other communities in the same situation, um, to the point where we kind of go back and forth with the person and, you know, please clarify, please help mm -hmm. us understand. Um, we've gone to the point of actually having someone come in and sit down with us and kind of look at what we had and, and try to help direct that person. Right. Um, so, so that sounds right. Okay. If that makes you feel better, that okay. sounds right. When you get a request for records and you don't understand it, don't try to fill it. Right. Always go back until you are certain what the person is asking for. The other thing, too, is a lot of times people will throw it against the wall to see what sticks. These massive requests for tons and tons of records. Some people do it to stick a finger in your eye, to be honest. Others do it because they don't know what they're asking for. So you try to work with them much in what you described, but also to try to get folks to narrow the scope of the request. You would be surprised how often a simple conversation, people automatically think, unfortunately, that the public agency is not going to comply and that they're going to give them a hard time. But if you show them that, no, I'm trying to get you the information that you're looking for, I'll give you the records, but can we try to narrow the scope? Maybe you don't need 12 years of emails. Maybe only, you know what I mean? So you have those conversations. That does a lot of things. First of all, it's goodwill. Second of all, it will cost them less money. Remember, you can charge 50 cents a page for records. 
And sometimes the cost can add up really quickly, and if the cost exceeds $10, you can get your money up front. So if you say, yeah, I'll give you all those emails, but it'll cost you 375 bucks, that could change the conversation dramatically. And then, so they get the information more quickly, it's less work for you, and everybody's happy. So never hesitate to do that. Always have those conversations. Um, we used to, when we had funding, we used to have a two-day program. A two-day program, and we did role-playing with just that sort of example to try to get people to, to understand how to work with it. It's not in the law anywhere, but we recommend it highly, so. Of course, no. Um, if you have somebody who's asking one, uh, something somewhat specific is, um, we have folks that were looking for costs associated with certain projects. Okay. Um, our accounting system doesn't necessarily identify that particular project. There are multiple departments involved in that project. Um, so basically we end up with you know 10 boxes. Um, not all costs. Um, but there were contracts in each of those boxes that would help identify that. Right. Um, would you make those boxes available to a person, or would it be on um, the city or the municipal to, to try to pull those items Another out? Another great question. You're never required to create a record that you don't have. So if somebody asks for something that you said your system doesn't produce it, you're not required to produce it. You're also not required to do research. So it sounds to me like sort of taking from this box and that box and putting it together mm -hmm. might be creating the report. So it might be a combination of those two things. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation was to have them come look at those boxes or have a conversation beforehand and explain what you just explained to me and say, look, we, we, don't, we can't generate that report. Here's what we can do. Do you want any of those? Um, and, and you know, you don't have to do research. You don't have to create something that doesn't exist. A lot of times people will come in is this a finance department? Or and they come in, they'll say, I want this report or that report. And if you don't have it, you just don't have to create it, okay? Let me talk about a couple of the exemptions, just so you understand how it works. The one that comes up a lot is the one of personnel records. A lot of people think, oh gosh, it's in a personnel file, nobody's ever gonna see it. Wrong, if you work for a public agency, even your personnel files contain public records. To not release something in a, in a personnel file the law says that the contents have to be an invasion of privacy. The standard for invasion of privacy was set back in 1993. A state Supreme Court case called the Perkins decision it was a situation where the, a teacher objected to the release of her attendance records. And the state Supreme Court said that the attendance records of all of us who work in the public sector are public records, period, end of story. And by the way, to have been an invasion of this woman's privacy, the release of those records would have to have been both highly offensive and not a matter of public concern. It would have to have met both prongs of the test. So, when you get a request for something that's in a personnel file, the person in charge is supposed to look at it and say, would releasing this be highly offensive and not a matter of public concern? Would it be an invasion of privacy? If the person in charge says, yes, it would, you then go to the employee and say, hey, look, the day is looking for these, these personnel th things. We think it's an invasion of your privacy. What do you think? And if you don't care, then out the records go. But if you agree, then, then the law says they can't be released until or unless the person today makes a request, a complaint to the FOI Commission, the Commission says, look, Rotten, with all due respect, there's no invasion of privacy there, give the records out. It's important to remember that you have to look at the records first, because if you don't, and the person making the request files a complaint, the complaint comes against you because you're the keeper of the records, not the individual, not the employee. People say, oh, how, do you, how, what, you know, how do you interpret that? I'll give you one example just to show you how it works. We had a case in Middletown a few years ago. It was a situation where there were rumors all over the place of a police officer having all kinds of trouble at home to the point where there was, there was real concern that his effectiveness on the job was being compromised. So they took him off the street and they put him on desk duty and they did a complete internal affairs investigation complete and total IA investigation. And the report said, yeah, this guy's having a ton of trouble at home, but he's, he's doing a great job as a police officer. There's no connection. There's a disconnect between those two things. So they do the report, they put it in his file, they put him back on the street, the Hartford Current asks to see the IA report. Now an IA report, a lot of people say, ooh, nope, that's a public record too, unless one of the exemptions applies. So Middletown PD looks at it and says, you know, there's a lot about this guy's home life in here 
but it really has nothing to do with his performance. So we think it's an invasion of privacy. We think it would be offensive to tell the world about it, and the public doesn't need to know. So it said no. The current filed a complaint with the FOI Commission. And the commission looked at it and said, you know, waived a lot of information about the guy's home life in there. That's nobody's business. It would be offensive to tell the world what kind of troubles this guy is having. And he's doing a great job as a cop. It's not a matter of public concern. Complaint dismissed, the report was never released. But the key is it's got to hit both prongs. You know, a lot of times this highly offensive material is in there, but it's something the public needs to know. You know, I don't want to get too graphic, but you've got a situation where a police officer is caught, um, I don't know, in a bar, on duty, something like that. I mean, that's, that's really kind of offensive, but the public would have a right to know it because they're paying, you know, this is somebody who's supposed to be protecting them. So you, you, you want to just have an idea on something like that. When I talk about records, remember that I'm talking about everything. Your emails, your texts, all those things are, in, in theory, records that people could see. People say, well, I'm just working at home. I was using my own laptop or my own tech doesn't matter. If you create something in the conduct of the public's business, it's defined as a public record. Now, it might be exempt, and again, we don't have, you know, we could spend hours going over these exemptions. If you have a specific one, I'll be happy to go over it with you. But always assume that when you create something in your jobs here, and those of you who are board members and staff members, that it could be a record that people could ask to see. I took a, I took a phone call a month or so ago from a woman. She says, hi, my name is Sean. I said, hi, Sean. She said, I'm calling you from Georgia. Georgia? Who's calling the FOI Commission in Connecticut from Georgia? She said, my husband is an out-of-state contractor, and he did a job in Connecticut last summer. OK, so now at least I got a connection. And I think he had an affair with a state worker. Why is she calling me? Anybody want to take a shot at why she's calling me, the FOI Commission in Connecticut? Can I see that state worker's emails? Can I see her text messages? And the answer is, if they are created in the conduct of the public's business, yes. You know, the email to the construction guy that says, let's meet in the construction trailer and go over the blueprints, and then, you know, dot, 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 or something like that. Well, that would be a public record. I said, yeah, if it has to do with the public's business. She said, thanks, it'll help me with my divorce proceedings. So just, you know, think about when you create these records, that there could be something that people could see. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm mindful of the fact that you've got work to do, um, and we're almost out of time. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I haven't hit on? <coughs> FOI request. Yeah. We have recently received an FOI request that was a mixture of asking for documents and asking questions. Right. Is the FOI process for Asking and answering questions. You know, as, I, as I said before, you know, like directions to the Capitol, the answer is no. You do not have to answer questions. How did you arrive at that figure? Why did you do this? No. It's, it's simple. It's access to the record, access to a record that has been created. So you do not need to answer questions under FOI. What if they ask for records that haven't been created yet, but probably will as a result of an ongoing investigation? Not required. The only record that you can ask for prospectively is an agenda. You can ask that it, an agenda, you know, I want all planning and zoning agendas going forward. If I make that request today, that request is good for a year. I should be on your mailing list. But everything else, no. So you can only ask for a record that exists. So if somebody wants to know the attorney cost for the total attorney cost at the, for, the, for an ongoing investigation. You can give them to date. Right. But, but you can't but it's give not going to be until the no. end. No. Okay. Absolutely not. That's what they were looking for. No. Okay. No. You had a question. <clears throat> yeah. Going back to meetings, uh, how does Robert's rules uh, affect uh, freedom of information? People usually use Robert's rules, but there's no there's no correlate there's no connection between the two. Robert's is fine. It's great. Um, but if something in Robert's doesn't agree with FOI, FOI would take precedent because it's state law. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Council, Anything else? any other questions, comments? Anybody? Audience? Can we come to caucuses? Absolutely. Caucuses, sure. When I talk to you about things that are not a meeting that would seem like a meeting, the law says that members of the same board, 
the same board and the same party can meet. Now, I don't know what you are, but just for, for purposes, let's say you four are the same party, okay? It means you could leave the room and talk about anything you want till the cows come home. But it can only be you four. If Deb joins the conversation, you're not having a caucus anymore, you're having a meeting. So same board, same party only, okay? And so, so that only include people on, actually on the board or commission? Only on the board, only of the same party. That's, that, that's not the same as town committees, by the way. Town committees are entities that are not public agencies. They're not covered by FOI. Yes? yes like I said, caucus is not covered uh, by FOI. Right. Okay. Same board, same party. Where people get into trouble with the caucus, let's have the town chair come in. Let's have this, this board caucuses and brings in the chairman of the board of finance. That's when you're, you're, you've gone in the wrong direction. So the town committee or city committee in this case, we keep minutes of our meetings? Yep. Are those subject to FOI? When you say of the, the city, the political democratic committee meeting, um, I would say no, because because the town committees are not under the umbrella of FOI. Um, so no. Did, did we clarify whether or not you have to have a quorum in order for it to be a meeting? Like if right now our quorum would be four, but if three people met, is that still a meeting? Or That's is that, that the. the what we, what we clarified is that the law is leaving us up in the air. That's the thing with the two rulings. You may have something in a charter or in bylaws that say no quorum, you can't meet. What we say is that if you go ahead and meet anyway, you need to follow FOI. Got it. Okay? Um, and, and we don't tell you what to do either way. I tell you, you know, you've got a second. Had a situation over in Woodbridge a couple of years ago. And they needed three for a quorum. So three of them show up. The problem is that one doesn't like the other two. In fact, one can't stand the other two. And after about five minutes, the one takes a hike and they're left with two people in a room full of people wanting to hear them do business. So they say, well, okay, we'll talk about stuff. We're not gonna vote because we have a, so they, they have a long meeting and blah, blah, blah. And then the one guy realizes that they stayed and met. He says, gee, I better find out what happened. So he asked them, the other two, for minutes. And they said, well, it wasn't a meeting. There was no quorum, we're not doing minutes. He filed a complaint, guess who won? He did. Even though he was the jerk who left, they needed to have minutes because they continued and they stayed and did work. So, okay. anything else at all? Now, folks, I you know I do these to try to help, but I also encourage you to think about picking up the phone and calling if you ever have a question. Some of you in this room have. I'm available. You just ask for me. Um, not at the end of this week. I'll be going to my daughter's wedding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but. In general, an email or a phone call, we're more than happy to, to help. And the answers there aren't, aren't binding. They're not orders. It's this is what we think you should do. You can say, oh, fine, we'll do something else. You know, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. But at least you'll have a foundation upon which to make a decision. I brought a couple of things that might be helpful. Some of you may have these. I call these the Freedom of Information American Express card. Don't leave home without them. They're highlights of the FOI Act. As important on the back, again, is our, is our phone number. Our website is on the back. It can be helpful. Gee, have we had any cases out of Rotten City before about this? And you type it in, and you can, and you can find it. So I'll, you know, I'll just maybe leave these here, and you can share them. And then I also brought some of these. These can be helpful. I call these the meeting cheat sheet. It's a grid about when meetings need to be noticed, and when to, those sort of things. And these can be helpful as well. So I'll leave those. Thank Any you. other questions? Anyone else? Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate you coming. Anytime out. at all. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. The next thing we're going to discuss is uh, 634 to City Council Rules of Procedure. H-E-N-N-I-C-K. Thank you. Sometimes my accent gets away. It sounds like <laughs> I-G, but it's Hennick. 
Okay, this is a referral 634. This is the Council Rules Committee. There was a Rules Committee met. Who would like to speak to this? Um, I can do that. That's fine. Okay. Um, so the Rules Committee met um, a special meeting on, I'm sorry, not 519.17. Um, and we made two referrals, I believe, um, for changes. Um, referral, um, let me see. 2D. If you look at your your copy, um, 2D. Um, there's some changes listed there. Appeal a decision made by the mayor on question of order. Such appeals being decided by the rules committee versus Roberts rules. The appeals goes before the vote of the body. So. Um, the mayor may speak on any question and shall decide questions of order. Any counselor may appeal a decision by the mayor on questions of order. Such appeals being decided by following Robert's rules of order, which is a vote of the whole body. Re and we're looking to redact the rules committee, such committee made up of three counselors appointed by the mayor. Meaning we don't have three people that need to excuse themselves from the committee, from the council meeting go make a decision and then come back. So that was our first one. Um, sorry, it's been a while since we did this. Uh, next one is 11A. Thank you. So 11A, we have been, um, it talks about citizens' petitions to the council. We've been doing five minutes, and it stated in this document 10 minutes. So we wanted to just make clarification on five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, and so we were recommending five minutes, but I mean, definitely could be up for discussion. Um, and then 12D was the last one. Um, Change 12D, delete majority, therefore the remaining verbiage is no less than four counselors. Um, these rules may be suspended in whole or part by no less than four counselors, which is a majority. I think the wording of it was just confusing. confusing. Okay. So any those were the recommendations that we made. Okay, any questions or comments? On um, 11A, it's, uh, we recommended changing it to five minutes. It also says five minute period unless otherwise indicated by a majority vote of the council. So we could change that. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and just to uh, expand on that, but <coughs> after uh, just listening to uh, Mr. Hennick, Hennick uh, did, if I understood him right, we could pretty much mandate the time depending on the situation, the amount of people here, the amount of time. So right. would that lock us into well, I think always giving five minutes or we might no, decide? I, I think we'd be okay. The challenge is sometimes in our, if you look at our regular council meeting, we say five minutes. Mm -hmm. So if we say five minutes, then to change it to three minutes, that could be problematic, but we could make that change. The cha the, and then what the town council has done is they've let people speak for three minutes when they've done that, and then they let them get back in line to speak again. Yeah. So that all citizens have the opportunity to be heard. That way, we're not uh, restraining freedom of speech. Everybody gets an opportunity to be heard. Um, Mr. Russell. The way I read this is all, I mean, all presentations by citizens under the rules should be limited to five minutes. And as Councillor Heed mentioned, unless otherwise indicated by a majority vote of the council. Right. So I feel like mm -hmm. we can change the time right. if right. needed. For example, if you had 70 people here in line yeah. to yeah. speak, right. 70 times five, we're going to be here. Right. We'd be up late. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions or comments on this? Okay, then, then I need a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting of July 19th. So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. 
Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. And the next thing is the it's 19th, is that right? July 19th, is that the right? Got to change the calendar. We got flipped the calendar. Hold on, I may be, I may have, I may have, I may have picked wrong, but I think. 17th. That would be 17th. Sorry, July 17th, not July 19th. Thank you. My apologies. So, we'll need. Do we need to amend the motion? We haven't voted on it yet. Oh, so. Uh, right. So we'll need a mo the motion for July 17th, not the 19th. So moved. Second. Okay. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. All right, the next one is 640 Municipal Employees Federal Credit Union. Okay, what this is about is <coughs> the for those of you that I think you guys have been briefed that we had a have an issue with radon down at credit union. And we had we've had it measured and in order to abate it, uh, then there's gonna be a cross ventilation system that would need to be installed. That um, that amount, the amount for that system is fifty five hundred dollars. Now we've talked to OSHA and we've talked to Much Light and we've talked to our attorneys. And the opinion is that the landlord is not responsible, but the the people that occupy are responsible. So I talked to the credit union, specifically Matt Morton, and one of the questions, they have about 18 months left on their lease. So they're uncomfortable with uh, having the burden of that $5,500 unless we committed to renewing the lease for a period of time. Now, the last time we talked about this, currently the lease is $1 a year, and it's up in approximately 17 months. Is that close? Okay. <clears throat> in the past, when we have come to the council, uh, there was also an issue about that the, that the municipality also needs room so the council had voted at one point not to extend the lease. One of the things that, that I asked for is to find out what the size of the space is and what a comparable uh, cost per square foot is. So currently the Federal Credit Union has 1,250 square foot in the ranges of places anywhere from $8 to $11 a square foot. $8 a square foot would be $12,500 a year, and $11 a square foot is $13,750 per square foot, or per year. <clears throat> so the, the, the question is, basically this is just a discussion to the council, is do we want to consider negotiating lease with the credit union, or do you want to stick with the previous recommendation from the council and once the lease is up, the lease is up. <clears throat> Additionally, if the, if the lease is up and then once the credit union leaves, then in order for us to occupy this, we would still need to install the unit that basically removes the, the radon. And the, the reason that the radon's a problem in the credit union and not a problem in the rest of the basement and it's not beyond permissible exposure limits is because the basement is open and has cross ventilation. Because it's a credit union, it's closed and the environment's closed so the air is not necessarily escaping except when you're opening and closing the door. What this remediation would do would drill a three inch hole into the floor, you put a pipe in, it goes up and over, there's an exhaust fan outside and that would remove the radon from underneath before it got into the, to the space. So if we were going to ask the credit union to, to share the, to not share, to have the burden of this, of this, of the $5,500, then we would need to look at extending the lease. 
if not, even if we decide to keep it ourselves, we're still going to have to do this. So the remediation is going to have to take place one way or the other. Depends on who's going to pay for it. But in order for the credit union to pay for it, they would they would like us to, at a future date, talk about negotiating the lease. Representative, uh, excuse me, Councilor Russ. Thank you. A couple questions. Um, what, when, or how long will it take for the abatement to occur, um, the abatement and the ventilation? And my second question is, what is the current agreement with the credit union? My understanding was that the agreement was when issues arose, they would take care of it. And I could be mistaken on my understanding of that. Okay. First thing is when we talk to the uh, to the installers, the presentation that was given to us that I talked to the credit union about was to take a couple weekends, do it piecemeal over a couple weekends. So once the authorization is turned on, it's really only going to take two or three days okay. uh, if it were done concurrent, but it's probably going to be done oh, if the credit union is there over the course of a couple weekends. Thank you. And then the second, the, your second question is, or yes, the answer to your second question is, and this is what the lease talks about is for the credit union would take responsibility if they're going to do that. Now, they only have 18 months left, and not to speak for Matt. Matt, if you, do you want to come up and talk a little bit, or do you want me to continue? Do you have any questions before I answer? Okay. Uh, well, we'll need, yeah, we'll need a microphone. Cur currently, the issue is that with the lease being only 17 months or so left, mm -hmm. the, the credit union is uncomfortable with uh, the full cost of $5,500. So in order for there to be a return on their investment, they would want an ex they would want an extended lease, and we haven't gotten into that discussion. That would have to be a further discussion. Well, the reason I'm bringing it to you guys is to ask whether or not you want to consider going into an extension with the credit union, or uh, the last, or do you want to continue with what was last decided by the council? previous council, and that was because the space is needed in front of the municipal employees that we were not going to renew the lease. Did that answer your question? Not completely. Okay, could you ask it again? Um, well, I mean, I think it did, but it just brings up so many more questions because this is really not just an easy topic. No. I mean, there's so many different things here. I guess the first question that I have is if the agreement is that for a dollar a year, the the credit union takes care of all of the issues then how is this any different than any other issue if the basement flooded you've taken care of that in the past yeah. i understand that there's only 14 or 17 months left but there's 17 months left and in that you're only paying a dollar a year um so that's kind of my first question the second part is do we still need the space because i don't think we can make an educated vote on whether or not we have them stay if we still need the space for other areas. Because the last I knew, we were talking about human resources taking up that space. Um, so there's so many multifacets of this issue. Okay. Well, let's see if we can answer some of your, some of your questions. Did, did Matt answer the one question for you? No, my first question was, if you are paying a dollar a day, or a dollar a year, then how is this abatement any different than any other issues that's been that have surfaced in the past? Well, because we feel that this is from the property, the radon is coming from the basement, from the property. Okay. We don't own the property. All we do okay. is lease it. And our our stance is, is that if I was, if this was a house and I was renting the house, the owner is responsible for any anything major, roof repairs, basement repairs. I mean, we've taken care of all the flooding in the past and it hasn't been the fault of the credit union. Right. It's because of nature, or there's been backups in the sewer system. But we didn't. We didn't argue. We paid for it. This is something different. And if we're if we're going to be leaving within two years, the radar has been here for a while. We can wait another two years and move on and go somewhere else. Okay. The space is still not going to be available to the city for at least a year and a half until we move out. And at that time, then the city would have to pay for the 
you know, the radon. We, you know, we understand a dollar a year is, that was negotiated 10, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we're amenable to increasing the, the amount, but we would also like a guarantee that if we're gonna, if we're gonna pay for everything, we wanna be here more than another year. We wanna be here for five to 10 more years. Okay. You know, well, did you, you had another we question? Can, I'll ask hey, my Councilor question. Councilor Sheffield. All right, so currently you're, on, you're under contract now. Yes, and it doesn't expire until December of 2018. Okay, so to remove the radon, you would be under contract to remove the radon based on the contract right now or no? We don't have to if we don't want to. Okay, I just wanted to make sure right. there was... Right. The radon exists. If the credit union is going to stay, we'll say we'll take care of it now. If we're okay. not going to stay... Okay, so if we extend your lease, you're willing to pay for it. So that's, that's simple. Okay. That's uh, and explanation is that they're currently in the situation, so the situation is not going to change in the next 18 months. Okay. <laughs> and that's a decision that they would have to make. That's right. not a decision that we would make. That's a decision the credit union would make. Councilor Russ. Are there any long-term effects of radon? Like what, what risks are we putting on people? Do you, would you rather get back to me on that? No, I can tell you <laughs> what the long-term risks are. <laughs> long-term exposure to radon can lead, can lead to lung cancer. Okay. Because radon so, is a gas. Radon is a gas that comes from the granite, right? We're lucky mm -hmm. that we have a lot of granite, so radon is going to be released. What happens is you breathe the radon in, you breathe the radon out, nothing happens. You breathe the radon in, radon decays, and the two particulate daughters that it decays to stay in the lungs, and they just happen to be, happen to be alpha emitters, which is the worst type of radiation as far as for your lungs go. So in my mind, that doesn't allow us a 14 or 17 month wait period. If we it's, know the radon's yeah, there, it's gonna then- It's going to turn into a legal issue. Right. You know? So someone has to pay for it, we've got to figure it out. I believe the ruling, and I could be wrong, was that the employer is the responsible party for that, I believe is what the ruling came back, I don't know. Yeah. Employer? No. Employer? No. Or the owner? The leasing. The tenant. Right. Oh, the tenant. The, the I'm sorry, I'm confused. Right, the, right, the right. Okay, let me get us all on the same page. Not the landlord, but the employer or the tenant that's there is responsible for that. Meaning, their responsibility. If they understand, if the credit union understands that there's radon in their rented facility or their yep. lease facility, then it is the landlords or that I'm sorry it is the credit union's responsibility to get rid of the radon correct but that was my question and who, <laughs> where's that from that's a state ruling that's a it's an attorney opinion we also talked to OSHA okay. and I think we also talked to Les Light I'd have to verify the third one with Carlton Smith but I'm fairly confident that's what he said to me okay when we were talking the thing that we we argue is the fact that if this was on another part of the, the basement floor where it's coming from, it's still within the city built municipal building. It's the city's responsibility. Now I, I know what what the the ruling is from the attorney, but once again, uh, another attorney may say something else. May say it's it's the landlord's. Like I said, comparing it to a house. If you're a, a renter in a house, you're not responsible for that. The landlord is, and you know, without getting into into an argument, you one attorney says one thing, another attorney may some, say something else. Right. At this point, we're willing to compromise, and that's what I'm looking at. Sure, I I mean just to address that, right. I am definitely not trying to get into an argument. I'm no. just trying to gather all the information exactly. that we can, exactly. um, and figure out where the city's responsible and where you're responsible. Correct. Um, in my other question to you is if you are willing to pay, say, $12,000 a year next in, in 18 months for reasonable rent, mm -hmm. then why not pay the 5500 now? Because it's considerably less and you've been paying a dollar a year up until right, now. I, I understand that. But 5000 it may, may be up to 6000 That can go towards our relocation fees if we can find a place sooner. Okay. 
and that's what we're looking at too. I mean, we've, we've started looking for other locations just because we have only have a year and a half, and it's gonna take time for us to renovate another building or wherever. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you know, $6,000 may not be a lot, but it is. In, in response to one of your questions, I don't think I've answered it, is the question about is there still a need? At the last department head meeting, there was still a need for space here in the, in the municipality. Is that we're correct? Gonna, we're put, planning to put a subcommittee together to talk about the space needs and reno all the renovations around the building. I also have a question. Uh, Deputy Mayor Garrison. In, in line with what uh, Council Russ was talking about. Uh, whose responsibility uh, is it to remove the radon or whose responsibility is it if there was somebody who made a complaint that they became ill because it, it sounds to me like the tenant uh, may be responsible uh, according to what the attorney said. In other words... But I, would, I would think it would be that the deep pockets could also be part of any problem. No, but, but I mean, w what I'm saying is, I think, just to make it understandable, that there's two issues. Uh, you don't have to get rid of the radon. You can stay there and leave it like it is. But should somebody get sick because of it, the liability falls on the credit union, not the owner of the, the property. Is, is that, do I understand the attorney's ruling? Right. I, I think. Could you check and see if Carlton's here? I think I, I thought I saw. Him. I, I, I think yeah. When when, we, when we're employee. when we're talking about stuff like OSHA, I think I think we got to be we got to be clear. Like you yep. said, that he has an obligation to have a safe work environment for his employees. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily have to be the basement here, right? But I think on on an OSHA level. Okay. Yeah. My my apologies. And I'm catching you cold, but this is about, this is Carlton Smith. Uh, the issue with the credit union and the judge's ruling in OSHA and uh, alleged light had said that it's a tenant's responsibility for the removal of the radon. So the question is, should the tenant decide to stay in the space and we're aware that there's radon and we're the landlord it, should something happen to one of their employees, who would be responsible? Is that, would that be the, t and you may not know the answer, and, and I'm okay if you say I don't know, then we'll take it as a lookup, but where does that responsibility lie? Um, I'd, I'd really like to go under the, I'm, I'm okay. not sure. Okay, <laughs> not, that's an, that's an we, acceptable answer. We had answer. attorneys ruling on this, right? We right. had OSHA ruled on this, uh, that it was the um, employer responsibility for the employee that's why it's not a public building only the, the definition of public building that, that radon fell under was schooled uh, on there um, so you know I don't, I don't want to put myself on record or two or any nope. of the council of the right. mayor in a position that nope. I can't back up nope. with that understand yeah. but but our, the ruling that we got from the lawyer was that the employer is responsible for the removal of the radon yeah. okay so that is the one thing we have on record. Oh. Did, did that answer well, somebody's okay. question? So that would, mm -hmm. that would mean that if, if somebody got sick because of the radon, a customer or an employee there, the, re, the liability would fall on the credit union, not the, the city. That's what we're expecting by our attorneys and okay. by yep. OSHA, by Ledge Light. But you know everything's up for litigation. And I oh yeah, but I, I think I think if I if I may, I think that that's what the, the mayor was trying to. We had we had backtracked this every way to make sure yep. uh, that we were not being responsible. Or we Sorry. responded and, and made sure who the responsibilities lied on there. Uh, on, on there. That's why we had the rest of the building tested um, for their levels. We I mean we did outside work to make sure that you know we checked for everything, just not the credit. Right. Okay. Councilor Russ, you. Uh -huh. I, I'm just in a quandary here because I I understand your point, 
Um, but I also feel like it's really, really important that your employees and your customers are very safe. Um, and this isn't acceptable to me to have radon that you knowingly know is there. And and I feel like if the attorneys and OSHA and Ledge Life Health Districts are saying that it's your responsibility, then I have to put it back on you and say, this is a responsibility of the credit union. Um, but I want it taken care of. So I don't feel like we can just say it's it's on you and and throw our hands in the air. So I know that's ambiguous, but that's nope, right. I understand. Councilor Carter? I think, I think oh, okay. we would have to, um, I mean, to me, it would matter of what the long-term plans would be for that property, you know, um, if we were doing city business there in the future, you know, um, I could see how we're, I mean, at this point, we would need to get it cleaned up ASAP. Well, regardless. If, if, if we you know? are, if we are going to, if the, the, the city, the department heads have related to me that there is a need for the space. Yeah. So, and so that gets to the question that Matt had is, are we going to do a lease or are we not going to do a lease? Because part of their their decision, because Matt's got to go back to a board, mm -hmm. right? Part of the decision is, if we say, no, we're not going to renew the lease because we need it, need mm -hmm. the space, then a couple things will happen. One, Matt will go back to his board and they'll have to decide what they're going to do. <clears throat> Second thing is before we would put any of our employees in that space, we would have to clean it up anyway. to right. to install the radar removal system. Anyway, and we yeah. would not put anybody in that space until such time mm -hmm. that we would do that for our employees. So, so if that would be the case, I think we would we, we would see what they would bring to the table as far as getting that cleaned up if we're going to do it anyway. Um, and I see what you guys are saying as far as you know the minimal fees of the dollar or whatnot, mm -hmm. put it on them. But I think. When you go back to your was the committee or whatever, right. I think it would have to be you know you have these eighteen months, you know what are you going to put towards this? And I think us as a city would have to expect to to put something towards that, because he could go back to his committee and say, listen, we're not cleaning anything up. We'll just take that responsibility. Now we're stuck with it regardless. You know, if they're gonna right, right. But I think I think what the mayor's was getting at was <coughs> the, 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 the very first thing we have to discuss, like whoever goes in there has to do right by their employees per OSHA. Yeah, but that's per, still on them though. Right, or on us, well, if we are going to put employees yeah, in there. So yeah. I think the underlying thing to discuss, I think what we have to determine is, do we need the space? And I think the answer is yes. Well, they said yes, and, and, and that's what I'm saying. So we're gonna clean it up, right? Regardless, right. it's gonna be cleaned up regardless, right? right? So as a monetary standpoint, what's gonna work out for us? Because they can go, he could go back and say, all right, we talked to my our attorneys, we're not gonna help with this. Right. You know, we're gonna do our 18 months and that's that, you know? We can just tell them as well, okay? After the 18 months is done, we're gonna go elsewhere, you know? Right. Um, but if they're willing to help, you know, with the fee, I mean, I don't see why we wouldn't, you know, see what he brings back to the board as far as us both paying some, you know. It's a lot better than, than saying, no, we're not gonna clean it up. You guys are gonna take it over in 18 months, clean it up yourself. Yes, Reed. Uh, first, I believe we need the space, so extending the lease is not something I'm in favor of. Yeah. Uh, second, before we do anything, share costs or expenses, um, I would need to know that we wouldn't open ourselves up to a liability issue. Mm -hmm. As far as if we could split you the costs, could you then we that? suddenly own half the problem. By cleaning it up? By contributing to the cost, you might buy into a lawsuit. I mean, total hypothesis, I have no idea. I think that's something that we definitely would want to talk to the attorneys about. There's nothing we can just do right here. Can, can we Go ahead. table this? And we, this well, we could, we could. Table. Maybe Table's not the right answer. Table's not the right motion, because uh, table is a motion. Uh, what we could do is we could bring it up at the next ca committee of the whole, mm -hmm. and you can tell me what questions you want to get answered, right. and then we can make sure we have the right people here to answer those questions. Is that yes, you, correct? Yes, you, you want to leave it for further review. Okay. And then so we, we can leave it We can leave it on the committee of the whole. Mm -hmm. Then we could give Matt a, a firmer answers to Please, I appreciate how we want to go. <laughs> yep. 
at the same time, you you may want to go back to your board to let them know that we're kind of half in, half out yep. on this. Is that like, like I said? I understand that if, if we do stay there, a dollar a year isn't gonna isn't gonna stand. I, mean, I mm -hmm. realize that, but we're just looking. This, like I said before, this credit union was organized by the city of Groton and Groton Utilities employees way back when. I mean, we've always been in a municipal building. When it was on Fame Street, our credit union was in the, in the building there. When we first moved here, we had an office on the first floor here. And then we got moved downstairs as we needed more space. We renovated the basement to create that, that space for the credit union. You know, it was no cost to the city. Um, we just, we're just looking to stay here and be part of the city municipal complex. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right, Matt, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the next one, 641 State Surplus Property on 18 Pink Street. you guys have something on this? Is it something on 641? Yeah, the old state police barracks. We, the Department of Administrative Services has offered us the first right of refusal on this property. The property is as is conditioned for $779,100 non-negotiable. So, the, the, the question that is to you tonight is, do you want to exercise the first option and say, yes, we want, want this property, or do we say no? If we say no, we're done, and we'll get back to them. If we say yes, then there's local procedures that we have to follow, certain forms we're going to have to fill out and things like that. Plus, it's $779,000 we don't just have in the corner. So... I certainly would like to take a look at the property first before uh, making a decision. Uh, so I think that would be the first thing. We would like to see the property uh, first. Okay. Anyone else? Sorry, Councilor Reed? I'm um, sorry, I just blanked. <laughs> there are three organizations now. Um, I'll pass to you on all. Oh. So this is the old boys group home on the corner, yes. correct? Okay. Um, and do we have any use for the property? No. Nope. The city, city does not have a use. And I'll also remind you that I just sent a letter to the town to give them the Colonel Ledger school back. Yeah. I... The question was, what happens? Are they putting the building up for sale uh, or are they going to sit on it if we don't buy it? And then second, I was going to mention the same thing that we already are giving back a school. I don't think we need to go and purchase another building. The, the, there was an original offer letter in March 16, 2017. We have 120 days from the date of the offer letter to respond in the positive. If we do not respond in writing in that 120 days, the state will consider it to be a waiver of our right to purchase. So the state would then could then go out to bid for other other pro for other people to purchase that property. Mm, for well, they would go out to bid for re residential use. Well, it doesn't say for residential use. They would buy that property, and then whatever it's zoned, that's what they could use it for, unless they came back to uh, planning and zoning with a with a. Uh, a recommendation for a zoning change. I mean, we do have processes where you can you can uh, get changes in zoning. Uh, who, well, w. Mayor I, I was just going to make a comment. I, I would love to own that building. <laughs> I, I would love to to, to have it to, would, would make a, a, a good police department. But we're talking a lot of money that we don't have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if we bought, if even if we could afford to buy it. We would have to, to renovate it and, and make it uh, adaptable uh, for those. And like you said, uh, we've already got a building that we're trying to get rid of. So I, I, uh, 
when I first saw that that it was going to be available, because uh, I used to say back when Troop E moved out of there, it would have been nice if we uh, had it. But uh, I, I, from from the dollar point of view, I, I don't see how we can. I, I will also remind you that we have the Mother Bailey House, in which we are mm -hmm. working with the Mother Bailey, yeah. the Anna Warner Bailey chapter of the DAR to. They are working on a plan so they can come to us. They have the ordinance for the disposition of, of municipal property. And so currently there are two properties that we are in uh, different stages of either getting to a new owner or getting back to the original owner. Councilor Rusk. If Councilor Sheffield would still like to take a peek at this property, I understand that, but I'm saying I, I don't feel like it's in our best interest for the city to own this property. Okay. Um, Deb, do we need a motion or can I do this with a consensus? I believe you can do it with a consensus because you're not moving it to right, we're accept not, it. Right, we're not moving this to, if the, if the consensus is no, then it's, it, it doesn't see the light of day, it's done. So what's your general consensus? Do you want to do you want to move it to the 17th to talk about it again or do you or put it on a council or do you want to uh, say no? I say no. Say no. 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 Sorry. Councilor Carter. I mean, what, do, we, do we need the property or no? I mean, it's not a need if, you know, I don't think. Uh, we don't need the property, then no. Then no. Councilor Reed? Councilor Sheffield? I guess if the consensus is no, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. Just, you know. All right, so the consensus is no, and then we'll go back to the state. The next one is 642, which is the Regional Community Enhancement Task Force Interlocal Agreement. Uh, Chief, would you like to come and brief us on that, please? Yeah, please. This is an agreement uh, that we enter as well as the uh, participating uh, town police departments. Uh, they're listed on your uh, on the agreement copy that we have there, which will include the town of City, the town of Grand, the town of Ledger, the city of London, the town of Stoney, Tim, and the town of Waterford. And uh, although we have been working with uh, this group, uh, the acronym is RECTIF, um, in a variety of different investigations, which I'm sure you've read about in the paper, they've been very successful. This uh, standardizes it a little better, uh, gives us all a little more protection, and allows for those officers in the participating town, whichever town they're in, to have uh, sworn powers while they are working in the task force. Uh, Deputy Mayor Garrish. Chief, uh, is, with, I read the, uh, the, the information that was supplied to us. Uh, does that sort of like would be replacing what we're commonly uh, accustomed to with mutual aid? Is it, is it, it pretty much in line with that? It is in line with mutual aid, except yeah. with mutual aid, um, it's when a participating uh, town city uh, request an emergency response for that police department, then they are covered in that regard. Uh, but in this case, it would be the actions of the uh, task force itself during the course of the investigation, uh, whether it be surveillance, uh, search warrants, arrests, uh, that, that kind of thing. And it, and it would only uh, pertain uh, if, if they were working in that capacity, only in that, only it wouldn't, in that capacity. wouldn't be a general no. powers of arrest no. type no. thing. No. The town no. police department already has powers of uh, arrest here in the city. Right. Uh, none of the other surrounding towns do, uh, and we don't in the other towns. Right. Uh, but this would give them, give us, and give them the opportunity to a little more protection to have that right um, when we are actually doing the investigations within the task force uh, right. confines. And it, it sounds like it. It protects the individual officer uh, as well as 
the community that he, that he represents. Correct. That, that's the take I got. Correct. Right. State statute allows uh, police officers, no matter what town they're from, if they see a felony occur, to go ahead and make a uh, take action. Right. Uh, but other than that, they can't. Um, so in this regard, if they're doing an investigation and something all of a sudden thing happens and they have and they uh, right. feel a need to uh, take action, they don't have to worry about whether or not they actually have that uh, power to really do that. I, I uh, just to conclude, not to take the floor, but uh, I, I read the thing uh, in, in detail, and, and uh, I, I thought it was an excellent uh, way to go. But and, and I know that we share services with a lot of other departments from time to time on various cases, and, and I thought that fit in perfectly for, yeah. for the protection of everybody involved. So. Yes. I thought it was good. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Councilor Beck? So, so what are the mechanisms that that kick off, say, the task force, or you know, so so what would, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to understand, um, you know, if if Stonington wanted to investigate somebody here, is, is it the chief talks to this chief and then? Yes, all, all the uh, police chiefs in, in the participating towns are part of the uh, board, if you will. And if any one particular uh, chief wants some action to be taken in, in their particular uh, city or town, then they have that request the uh, task force to, to do so. Okay. So, um, all right. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this? With that, I'll make a motion to move it to tonight's uh, special mayor and council I'll meeting. Make that motion, man. Second. And we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. And then the last thing is what everybody's here for <laughs> is uh, number one, the police officer candidate Xavier Crawford. I will, would, I need a motion to go into executive session pursuant to Connecticut General Statutes 1 Tech 206 a to discuss personnel police department to include Xavier Crawford, Chief of Police, and the council. Mayor and Council. I so move. Second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We will have action coming out of this out of this meeting. Devil can out of the executive session at 825. Okay. We need a motion to move the appointment to tonight's special mayor and council agenda meeting. So, so moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All, uh, opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, we're going to go straight into the special mayor and council for Monday, June 26, 2017. Uh, Clerk Patrick, will you please call the roll? Present are Mayor Keith Ketrick, Deputy Mayor Lawrence Garish, Councilors Joe Rusk, Jamal Beckford, Stephen Sheffield, Conrad Heath, Rashad Carter, Finance Director Ron Newhouse, Clerk Deborah Patrick. No, it's a special meeting. <laughs> <laughs> as much as we all want to, it's not on the agenda. Okay, Councilor Rusk, will you lead with uh, R-17-6 as 107. Thank you. Um, resolution R-17-6-107. Therefore, be it resolved that the Mayor and Council approve the appointment of Xavier J. Crawford as a probationary police officer grade D in the City of Groton Police Department and that the appointment be effective July 3, 2017. I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing, hearing, uh, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Councilor Becker. Do you want him to? Oh, shoot. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Patrick, I'm, just, I'm ready to get done with the meeting. Sorry. <laughs> Patrick, will you? He's got a, he's got a, lot, he's got a lot to say about this. Okay, uh, you're right. <laughs> Gosh, I should start over. Chief, will you? Mayor Hedrick, Deputy Mayor Garish, and Rod City Councilors. My pleasure to present to you Xavier Crawford for your consideration to be appointed as City of Brighton Police Officer. Uh, Xavier is a city resident and has lived here his entire life. 
Xavier attended Groton Heights Elementary School, Westside Middle School, and Fitch High School. Xavier also attended Three Rivers Community College and Westfield State University, where he has earned credits toward his degree in criminal justice. Xavier has volunteered at Fitch High School, assisting in the hiring process for new incoming teachers, as well as with the football team. While in high school, Xavier was captain of the varsity football team in 2014 and named an All-Eastern Connecticut Conference outside linebacker. And with your approval, Xavier is looking forward to starting his new career at the City of Rock Police Department. Okay. Thank you. Patrick. solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge all the duties of police officer grade D in the police department city of Groton, Connecticut. Court, oh, raise your right hand, I'm sorry. It's contagious. <laughs> Say your name again, please. Xavier Crawford. Thank you. That I will do solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge all the duties of a police officer grade D in the police department city of Groton, Connecticut, according to the laws and policies governing said department that I will serve the community with integrity, compassion, and fairness, that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America, the Constitution of the State of Connecticut, and the City Charter of the City of Groton, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the City of Groton, Connecticut, and to the office entrusted in me, so help me God. I'd like to ask uh, Valerie Clark, uh, Xavier's grandmother, to come here and please pin her. for the crowd. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for approving me. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to the City of Rodney. All right, we, yeah, <laughs> we have cake. It, give us one minute. Councilor Beckford. Sure. Um, R-17-6-108. Therefore, be it resolved, that the Mayor and Council authorize the City of Groton to enter into a Regional Community Enhancement Task Force interlocal agreement with the Town of Groton, Town of Ledger, City of New London, Town of Stonington, and Town of Waterford, and execute said agreement. I so move. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. I'll take a motion for adjournment. I move the adjourn. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs>